Welcome, everyone, to the G Note Podcast. I am your host, Jason Spicy G Goldman, and I'm a Grammy winning record producer, arranger, and musician. I've been a music professor at USC for over 22 years, and I am most known for writing and producing music for the iconic Michael Buble over the past two decades. This is a podcast for musicians who want advice and strategies on navigating the music industry. If you're not a musician but a music fan, I promise there is plenty in here for you as well. On this pod, we talk all things music. On today's pod, we are talking about how to be an effective band leader. Let's go. Welcome back, everyone. On today's episode, as I mentioned, we are talking about how to be an effective band leader. And this is for, obviously, current band leaders and for those who are hoping to become a band leader. I'm going to be dropping a lot of information in this episode, so you may have to listen twice. But this stuff is important if you want to be a successful band leader. Being a band leader is hard work, if you do it right. Don't let anyone tell you different. It means that you are responsible for making sure that the music is amazing and the musicians are being treated fairly. This is a topic very close to my heart as I have been a band leader for a very long time, starting in high school with small combos, in college moving to big bands, and then lots of different ensembles uh, over my time in the music industry. Here's one of the most important rules. Respect people's time. A vast majority of times, especially in the early stages of your career, you're hiring people and they're doing rehearsals for little or no money. You need to honor that. Sure, the player can always say no, but if they say yes and agree to do the rehearsals for not much money, make sure a couple of things happen. Number one, the rehearsal starts and ends on time. It's really, really crucial that you don't waste people's time. So, you know, if you, if you say you're going to start at eight o'clock at night, even if some people aren't there, you got to start the rehearsal and you have to end when you say you're going to end because again, it, time is valuable and musicians have a lot to do. So keep that in the back of your mind. Second thing, don't have the musicians pay for parking. You know, I mean, it's, it's usually bad enough that musicians aren't getting paid most of the time, you know appropriate wages, but to have them pay for parking and lose some of the money they're already making on parking is not good. Metered parking, yeah, I understand that's on the street. Sometimes you have no choice and that's usually pretty cheap. But just keep that in the back of your mind. Another really important thing as a band leader, make sure the music looks great. The roadmaps, as they call them, otherwise known as charts. So when the band is reading the music, um, if you're not familiar with this, you know, sometimes the music can look all, you know, they made cuts in the chart and there's pencil mark all over it. That's never a good thing. It wastes rehearsal time and it gets uh, musicians frustrated, especially if they make a mistake because of the the chart being such a disaster. So make sure the music looks great. Make sure that the other musicians in the band are at a similar level and can hang with the other members of the band and play their parts. Now, this is actually kind of important and overlooked quite a lot, right? Meaning that if you have a band of, of let's say, average musicians, we'll say average musicians, and you get one person that's really incredible uh, or even really not that good, it affects the rest of the it affects the rest of the band. The person who may be really, really good may feel like they're wasting their time playing with average musicians. They shouldn't feel like that, but that happens a lot. The person who maybe is not that good is affecting the band in that they're having a hard time playing the music, and you may have to waste time on things that you shouldn't have to waste time with, with helping that particular, um, you know, person learn the music. This is a key point, folks. Musicians can tolerate a lot of things, and we do. Low money, crappy food at the gigs, um, terrible um, clients. But the one thing we really can't tolerate is the wasting of our time. 
And it's really one of the, the worst things that you can do. So you should make that, uh, hopefully you'll put that down as a mental note. Please, don't waste musicians' time. Okay, next. Treat your musicians like you would want to be treated. This is huge, folks. Speak to them and treat them the way you would expect to be treated. I mean, it's, I know that's like a standard thing and, you know, your parents say that to you all the time, but don't talk down to people. That never works and it really just puts out a bad vibe and a bad vibe in the music industry can be literally a death wish. People, your, your name will get around as being like, you know, this person's really difficult to work with. Um, you know, you don't, they don't feel comfortable around you. They feel like you're, you're their quote unquote boss. I mean, even if you are technically, that still doesn't mean you should treat them like that. You're not going to get the most out of people like that. So treat your musicians like you would want to be treated with respect. Next, this is a big one. Pay people a decent wage. I know money is always tight, but don't be an a-hole. I mean, just don't. Like, if the money's so bad that you can't pay the musicians a a decent wage, then just don't take the gig. I know that is kind of a downer, but seriously, if you can't pay players a decent rate, and by decent, you know, would you want to be paid that rate? And that should be the, one of the questions on your mind when you're thinking about this. How would you feel if someone offered you $40 for a two-hour gig? Right? And don't forget, that's, the, that's two hours of playing time. Then they have to drive to the gig and drive home. So all of these things equate. So it may be a two-hour gig, but it may have taken them three to four hours of their time for 40 bucks. You're talking about way below minimum wage. So... That's really, really crucial here. Pay musicians a decent wage and pay them what you think is fair and what you would be fine uh, taking on a gig. If you're in college, I get it. You do free gigs. And by the way, all of us do free gigs. I mean, or have done free gigs uh, for each other. But honestly, I just don't recommend you do that. You really don't want to owe anyone as that can come back and bite you in the long run. Because, you know, maybe they did you a favor and then they're going to call in the favor, but their favor they're calling in could be way more than what you could have just paid that person an extra 50 bucks for and totally been squared. So think about that in the future, you know, in terms of how you're paying musicians and your players and you want them to be happy and feel appreciated, right? I mean, yes, your admiration is is part of it, but also showing, you know, with the, the financial means of a gig. If you need to, start asking people for more money to pay the musicians. You know, if, internally, you need, you, know, you need to know that. You don't need to tell that to the, the client, but really, really important. Okay, moving on here. This is big, and this is just specifically internal for band leaders. Stop undercutting each other. Folks, most musicians undercharge. Yes, you heard that correctly. Everyone is so afraid of turning down a gig because they need the work. And let me say, I totally understand. I really, really do. I was young and broke as well. And I vividly remember at one point having 75 cents in my bank account when I just moved out to California. But if you undercharge, you're actually not only hurting yourself, but you're hurting all of the other musicians as well. Here's the thing. If you don't charge enough and it seems cheap, well, to most people and clients, right, that means that it is cheap. So in their heads, they're going to be making a decision, right, in the client's head, whether they want a professional group or, quote, unquote, the bargain group. And guess what? If you undercharged, you're the bargain group that they're thinking of. So they're just trying to decide between, well, I could save a a bunch of money over here. Maybe we just, we don't need the professional group. We could just use the bargain group. And I can tell you this, most people do not want the bargain group, especially if they have a boss they have to report to. You know, the last thing they want is a group to sound like shit or to be like, oh yeah, I saved us some money, you know, on on the band, like 300 bucks. Like again, most companies and corporations are going to be like, So you save 300 bucks to get us a lesser group. So keep that in mind, folks, as you're charging. 
So what is a cheap rate? Well, I can't really give you that because things are different depending where you live and the scene around you. You know, a gig in LA is going to be different in uh, Oklahoma. So it, it really just depends. But what I can say is start higher than you think. Also, here's another pro tip. When I was doing casuals, uh, and just for those that don't know who are not musicians listening, casuals are like bar mitzvahs, weddings, cocktail parties, basically any gig where the music is not being featured. It's just a background. I used to negotiate with the clients until one day I decided not to do that. I just said, this is the rate. And guess what? I got paid more, <laughs> right? You, again, you, you don't think that's going to be the response, but it actually is most of the time. Again, they don't want really you to negotiate because if you, get, if you do again, it's like you're negotiating a cheaper rate and it's like once you do that, then you're again, you're going into the cheaper category. You have to make venues and people understand that, sure, they can hire someone cheaper, but they run the risk um, of it not being professional. And trust me, the thought of that changes most people's mind, as I just mentioned before. All right, this is a really important point right here that I'm going to make. Band leaders, you need to take more money. Now, there's plenty of reasons for that, and let me tell you why. You, besides you doing more work, you're organizing the band, making sure the music's right, interacting with the clients, but you are also the name that's on the hook if something happens, right? If someone doesn't show up, if something happens, they're going to want to take less money overall from the group. So if the bass player doesn't show up, it's your reputation. If there was a misunderstanding on the bread, in some way, shape, or form, it's not coming out of the musician's pocket because you already told them what you were going to pay them. It's coming out of your pocket. It's you who's going to take the hit. So this is important to understand. And any musician who complains about you as a leader making more bread, I recommend strongly that you not hire them again. You are the one that carries all the risk. So it's only fair for you to reap some of the reward. Not to mention that a lot of times these things come back in cycles. So yeah, I may make an extra three, $400 on a gig from everyone else, but then at another event, I may end up having to, you know, if we're playing at a club and the door, if we're playing for a lot of the door uh, and we don't bring in enough people, again, I'm still paying the musicians that rate and I'm the one who's going to be taking the hit. So I may get less than the other musicians. So again, it's all kind of a cycle. On another note, when you're paying musicians, you the band leader have to pay them in a timely manner. It doesn't matter if you have to fight with a client or venue to get the money. Your musicians already provided the service. I'm not saying they need to be paid immediately, right? But certainly in a timely manner, within two weeks as a point, if you're looking for a point of reference. If you make them have to chase you for bread, your musicians, they will likely not want to work for you again. I can tell you with my group, the 17 Big Band, which I'm always promoting usually at the end of the podcast, that we play at Vibrato Jazz Club like every two, three months. I always try and make sure things are easy. I treat them with respect. I know they are working musicians, so if someone has to sub out because of a higher paying thing now and then, I get it. But I also reward and acknowledge loyalty. I try and be consistent with my rules. I almost never get a sub for only a rehearsal and the original player for the gig. That's just, it's just not fair, right? I mean, if someone can't make the rehearsal and you need to be, have them there at the rehearsal because you know if they're not, if there could be problems, just get someone else. Just say, sorry, I totally understand, but I need someone also for the rehearsal. You know, if I have to do that, I make sure, like if, if I'm in a dire circumstance and I need someone just for the rehearsal, then I'll make sure that I pay the sub for the rehearsal. But again, I almost never do that. Remember, these, these cats are trying to make a living. While I understand paying your du dues, I mean, that's always what older musicians, well, you got to pay your dues. Man, that's just bullshit. Like, paying your dues should be like, you're getting paid, but you're playing hard music and people are kind of giving you a hard time. Maybe like, man, you didn't learn the music well enough. You did Like, that's paying your dues. Or maybe you're an assistant to someone bringing coffee. 
But being a sub and not getting paid or not even having a chance to get the gig, like, I'm sorry, that's, that's not paying your dues. That's just BS. Let me give you an example of how I lead my big band. And as I mentioned, if you've listened to this pod before, my band is called the 17 Big Band. And it's because I have 17 musicians in the band. Not to mention, usually I'm working with two to three vocalists when we play. And as I mentioned, we play at Vibrato all the time. And I, here's, here's some of the things that I think that you should do that I do that I find very effective. One, I do my best to advertise and make sure the venue is packed. And it is. I don't want cats playing to a half empty room at this point in my career. Yes, that falls on you a lot of time as someone who's booking a gig, if, if you are booking the gig, as the band leader. So this is if you're playing clubs. It's your responsibility to get people there. The musicians can help you with posting on social media, but do your best to try to make people sure people are showing up. You know, keep in mind, this is a big band gig that I have. So the expectation for getting paid decent bread is not super high, right? Because there's 17 musicians plus two or three vocalists. However, I always give the band a guarantee. This is something you want to do. This can be dangerous because most clubs do a combination of like a set fee and you get a portion of the door. So we have to bring in enough people or I'm coming out of pocket. But it's worth it to me. The point here is the guarantee. You're saying no matter what happens with the band, it's like you're going to get this money. And guess what? If you bring in a lot more money, you don't have to give the rest of the band more money, right? You can keep that for yourself because again, it usually comes back around. Then the next time, maybe you do have to come out of pocket. But guess what? If you took more last time, maybe it all equals out. All right, the next important thing is I individually text everyone two to three months, usually prior to the gig if possible. But I always text them and and say, hey, are you available for this gig? This is what I need you for. Once the musicians agree to do the gig, then, and this is really important, folks, I send out an email with all of the details. Here's what's included. The date of the gig, the rehearsal place and time, the show date and time, the venue that we're playing for both, like I said, the rehearsal and, and um, the, the show. The sound check time, I, the exact times of the sets, if there's two sets. And I put the price guarantee in the email. I don't want any ambiguity, right? I don't want people coming back and saying, well, you told me this. No, you have it in an email. Finally, I send a link to a Dropbox folder or just a box folder with the PDFs of the music that we'll be playing. This is so the musicians can actually practice the music before either the rehearsal or the gig. So now they have all of the details. Now, granted, I'm sending them the music and asking them to practice or at least giving them the option to practice. And I can tell you, 99% of the time, they will take the option to practice it because they want it to be great. They do. They don't want to just show up, most musicians, and, and have a crappy sounding band. So I send them the music. The musicians come to rehearse. We start on time. I specifically do rehearsal in the evening when parking is free. They sit down. The chairs and stands are set up. All of the folders are on the stands if, you, if you're doing stuff that requires reading music. I have the order in which I want to go through the charts. The, the music looks pristine. We end almost always on time. I mean, I, I mentioned this before. I try always to be on time. And most of the time, 99% of the time, it happens. The musicians then come to sound check. I start and end the sound check on time. I try and make sure the venue provides a hot meal and at least, you know, an alcoholic beverage for the band if they want it. We play the set and it almost always, matter of fact, I could probably say at this point, always sounds amazing. Why? Because the vibe is incredible. They only have to worry about making the music great and not all of the other details. That's on you as a band leader. That's why you should be taking more money because you need to make sure that their experience is pleasant so that they continue to want to work with you and give you everything they have to make the show great. Folks, there was a ton of information in this episode. And as I mentioned at the top, you may have to go back and listen to this twice. 
remember, put things in the email, all the details. Again, it's like a contract, but not one, but at least everything's kind of written down. Really, really important. Finally, the last thing I want to say about band leading, make sure after the performance or after the gig, at some point within a day or two, you text them personally and thank them for playing. It shows your appreciation of them and it shows gratitude. And that is really important to keep the vibe with your band. And if you do that, they will do anything for you, which is what you're really looking for. All right, everyone, we have come to the end of today's episode. If you haven't already, please subscribe to this pod so you can stay up to date with new shows, giveaways, and more importantly, the concerts. Come out to Vibrato and see my big band. We have a blast. Everyone has a good time, and I promise that you'll have a good time as well. We play there usually every two to three months, and you can check the Vibrato Jazz Club website uh, to see when we're playing next. Or you can follow me on Instagram at SpicyGMusic, or check out my website, JasonGoldmanMusic.com, to see what projects I'm currently working on and to see when I'll be performing next. Thanks so much for listening, everyone. Much love. Peace. Peace.